What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics, and today we got a good one. We got Oasis and their debut album, definitely, maybe brought to us by our friend, longtime supporter, and patron of the channel, Richard. Thank you, Richard. This is an album I have not listened to. We have got What's a Story, Morning Glory Up, and tons of other Britpop and Oasis stuff, but I've never given this one a spin, so it is going to be fantastic. Richard says, uh, it's their debut album from 1994, which in my opinion is the best album from the Britpop era. That is high praise. And some of the album facts and background before we jump into it. It's a debut album released by Creation Records in August of 94. It sold 100,000 copies in its first four days and debuted at number one on the British charts. It outsold the second highest album by a factor of 50%. The first week sales earned it the record of the fastest selling debut album in British history at the time. It sold over 8 million copies. Kind of the story behind it, they booked Monau Valley Studio near Rockfield in late 1993 to record the album. Their producer was Dave Batchelor, whom Noel knew from his days working as a roadie for the Inspiral Carpets. The sessions were unsatisfactory, and Bonehead recalled it wasn't happening. Batchelor was the wrong person for the job. We'd play in this great big room, buzzing to be in this studio, playing like we always played. He'd say, come in and have a listen, and we'd, like, we'd be like... This doesn't sound like it sounded in that room. What's that? It was thin, weak, too clean. Not to mention those sessions were costing 800 pounds a day. As they became increasingly fruitless, the group began to panic. Bonehead said Noel was frantically on the phone to the management going, this ain't working for, his not, for it not to be happening was a bit frightening. Bachelor was fired and Noel tried to make use of the music already recorded by taking the tapes to a number of London studios. Tim Abbott of Creation Records said while visiting the band, uh, McGee, Noel, me, and various people had a great session, and we listened to it over and over again. And all I could think was, it ain't got the attack. There was no immediacy. In January of 94, they returned from an ill-fated trip to Amsterdam and set about re-recording the album at Sawmill Studio in Cornwall. This time, the sessions were produced by Noel alongside Mark Coyle. The group decided the only way to replicate their live sound in the studio was record together without soundproofing between individual instruments with Noel overdubbing numerous guitars afterwards. Bonehead said, that was Noel's favorite trick. Get the drums, bass, and rhythm guitar down. Then he'd cane it. Less is more. Didn't really work then. <laughs> the results were still deemed unsatisfactory, and there was little chance of another attempt at recording the album, so the recordings already made had to be used. In desperation, Creation's Marcus Russell contacted engineer and producer Owen Morris, who had previously mixed the album's songs. Morris recalled after hearing the sawmills recordings, I just thought... They've messed up here. I guess at that stage, Noel was completely effed off. Marcus was like, you can do what you like, literally, whatever you want. Among Morris's first task was to strip away the layers of guitar overdubs Noel had added, although he noted that the overdubs allowed him to construct the musical dynamics of such songs as Columbia and Rock and Roll Star. Morris worked on mastering the album at Johnny Marr's studio in Manchester. He recalled that Marr was appalled by how in your face the whole thing was and would question Morris's mixing choices, such as leaving the background noise at the beginning of cigarettes and alcohol. Inspired by Phil Spector's use of tape delay on the drums of Lennon's song Instant Karma and Tony Visconti's use of the even tied harmonizer on the drums of David Bowie's Woe, Morris added eighth note tape delays on the drums, which went additional groove to McCarroll's basic beats. Tape delay was employed to double the drums of Columbia, giving the song a faster rhythm, and tambourines were programmed on several songs to follow McCarroll's snare hits. That may sound just like a whole bunch of studio speak, but I think it's really interesting to see how this thing almost never happened on multiple occasions. And it was almost just by taking it to the, the last guy you could find and letting him just do whatever and experiment in all these odd ways, you found their signature sound. Now, the release of the album was preceded by a third single, Live Forever, which was released on August 8, 1994, became their first top 10 single. The continuing success of Oasis partially allowed creation to ride out a period of tough financial straits. The album was still, or the, the label was still two million pounds in debt. So Tony Abbott was given only 60,000 pounds to promote the upcoming album. Abbott tried to determine how to best use his small budget. He said, I'd go back to the Midlands every couple weeks and people I know would say, Oasis are great. This is what we listen to. And I'd be thinking, well, you don't buy a lot of singles. You don't read the NME. You don't read Q. How do we get to people like you? Abbott decided to place ads in publications that had never been approached by creation before, such as football magazine, match programs, and UK dance music periodicals. 
His suspicions that Oasis would, would appeal to these non-traditional audiences were confirmed when the dance music magazine Mix Mag, which usually ignored guitar-based music, gave definitely maybe a five-star review. NME went nine out of 10, Mojo five out of five, Pitchfork 8.8 8 out of 10. In 2006, NME placed the album at number three on its list of the greatest British albums ever behind the Stone Roses self-titled debut, which we have a, a, a review of, and the Smiths, The Queen Is Dead, also have a review of that. Q placed at number five on his greatest albums of all time list back in 2006, and NME hailed it as the greatest album of all time that same year. All tracks are written by Noel. Before we jump into this thing, just a quick reminder, the music will not be in here, but there's a Vimeo link below. You'll be able to listen along with me. Well, let's kick this off, as you see below, with Rock and Roll Star. It's a single in the U.S. Noel said it was one of the only three songs in which he wanted to say something. Quote, I pretty much summed up everything I wanted to say in Rock and Roll Star, Live Forever, and Cigarettes and Alcohol. After that, I'm repeating myself, but in a different way. I'm going to have the lyrics up as always. Thanks again, Richard. Rock and Roll Star. Wow, what a great way to start an album, right? And Noel said later on about this too, he said the words and the sentiment to that song, that's what it's all about. I remember bringing it down to the lads in the rehearsal studio, rehearsing it until the the first time we played it live. There was a hush after it, and it wasn't the hush of people going, what was that all about? It was silence, awe. No one had ever said it in a song before. Tonight, I'm a rock and roll star. There's six people watching you, right? You're anything but a rock and roll star, but in your brain, you're a rock and roll star. When I hear that song on the radio or whatever, I just think, you know what, man? It's still got it for me. It's wide-eyed and wonderful, and it really is. He just talks about, I live my life in the city, and there's no easy way out. The day's moving just too fast for me. I need some time in the sunshine. I've got to slow it down. The day's moving just too fast for me. This goes on and on about this stuff. He's Then they said to me, I should feed my head. That, to me, was just a day in bed. I'll drive my, I'll take my car and drive real far. So, I'm not going to school, man. I'm not filling my head with knowledge. It starts, it, the outro is just rock and roll eight different times over this kind of, I don't even know how to describe that guitar tone, but it had everything I want out of my quote, Brit pop, right? Bonehead had a great solo in there. Um, the drums from Tony were fantastic. The bass work from Nolan Williams. Lyrics are right on, or his vocals are right on. Just totally enjoyed that song. Now, as you see below, we move on to Shaker Maker. First released as the second single in June of 1994. Went to 11 in the UK. Noel states the lyrics are taken from the world around him. For example, a Shaker Maker was a popular toy in the 70s. The character of Mr. Soft was taken from a Trevor Soft Mints commercial, which featured Cockney Rebel's song, Mr. Soft, Mr. Queen is a song by, or Mr. Queen is a song by The Jam, one of Gallagher's favorite bands. Mr. Ben is a British children's cartoon. So a lot of other things in here. So this was written in a taxi on the way to the recording studio. Uh, apparently Liam was pestering Noel to finish the song. At this point, the taxi stopped at the traffic light outside Sifters, a record shop in Manchester, named after people sifting through records. So all kinds of shout outs in here that those of you in the UK may get more than uh, me here in the US. Let's check it out. Shaker Maker. Nice little clap along there towards the end. The highlight bonehead and Noel's uh, guitar work. But I knew the first verse sounded familiar. I'd like to be somebody else and not to know where I've been. I'd like to build myself a house out of plastic. The verse melody of the song was taken, the first verse, or the verse melody of the song was taken from I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. A uh, song feature, famous for being featured in the 1970s Coca Cola ads. If, you're my age, you're going to know it. If you're not, you're not. But Oasis was sued and forced to pay up to $500,000. When asked about the incident, Noel stated, now we all drink Pepsi. So that's kind of funny, man. The song itself, you know, it's just those little shout outs that I said in the beginning. It's very catchy because the ah, shake along with me really repeats itself a ton. Very catchy. I didn't like it uh, as much, of course, as Rock and Roll Star, but still really liked it. Now we're going to move on to the only song that I think I, I know this song. I think it's the only one I know of here. Live Forever, third single released just prior to the album release, inspired by the Rolling Stones' Shine a Light, first Oasis single to enter the top 10 in the UK. I talked about that in the beginning. In the, in the, and uh, in the US, it reached number two on the Billboard's Modern Rock Charts and number 10 on the album Rock Tracks Charts, respectively. In 2007, Liam declared this his favorite Oasis song. Noel began working on it in 1991 while working for a building company in his hometown of Manchester. After his foot was crushed by a pipe in an accident, he was given a less strenuous job working in the storeroom, allowing him more time to write songs. One night he was listening to the Stones' album Exile on Main Street. We have a review of that up. While playing one of his own chord progressions, Noel noticed, noted that it sounded good against one of the vocal melodies from the album. 
It was the bit from Shine a Light that goes, May the Lord shine a light on you, Gallagher recalled. He incorporated the melody, changed the line to me. I don't really want to know. The song was instrumental in helping the band secure their record deal with Creation Records. Reflecting on when he first heard the song, Creation boss Alan McGee, who we talked about in the beginning, recalled, quote, it's probably the single greatest moment I've ever experienced with him. It's interpreted to be an ode to Noah and Liam's mother, Peggy. In general, the lyrics of the song stress an optimistic outlook. Noah explained that, quote, at the time it was written in the middle of grunge and all that. And I remember Nirvana had a tune called I Hate Myself and Want to Die. And I was like, well, I'm not effing having that. As much as I effing liked him, Kurt Cobain is talking about, and all that, I'm not having that. I can't have people like coming over here on smack, effing saying that they hate themselves and they want to die. That's effing rubbish. Kids don't need to be hearing that nonsense. So he was right in that man. While he has stated it, he did not intend to live forever as a direct retort to Nirvana or their music. He is a fan of the band. He contrasted the lives of Cobain and his band at that point, saying, seems to me that there was a guy who had everything and he was miserable about it. And we had F all. And I still thought getting up in the morning was the greatest effing thing ever because you didn't know where you'd end up at that night. And we didn't have a pot to piss in, but it was effing great, man. He considers the line, we see things they'll never see. The most important line of the song explaining that old friends tend to laugh at jokes and stories that no one else gets. 2006 was named the greatest song of all time in a poll released by Q. Pitchfork labeled the song as Oasis's best ever track. Live forever. What a fantastic song. I think when he hits that high note, you and I are going to live forever, really makes it stick in the head. But Noel's really good at just writing the outros to songs, right? He usually just repeats the chorus over or a line over, and it makes it stick in your head and wants you to turn around and listen to it right away again. And the lyric's pretty simple, just like he, he talked about uh, in, in the beginning. He said, maybe I don't really want to know how your garden grows because I just want to fly lately. Did you ever feel the pain in the morning as it soaks you to the bone? Maybe I just want to fly, want to live. I don't want to die. Maybe I just want to breathe. Maybe I just don't believe. Maybe you're the same as me. We'll, ne we'll see things they'll never see. You and I are going to live forever. Just a little bit of the positiveness of this song, but super, super enjoyed that one. Now we're going to move on to Up in the Sky. Noel said in 2004, he said, quote, we were on the dole at the time under conservative rule. It's about establishment figures who don't have a clue about how people were really living in England at the time and what they'd done to the country. It's quite an angry song lyrically to a happy tune. I always enjoy those. Train, I always enjoy the, the lyrics not matching kind of the, the song and the arrangement. It's always fun. Up in the sky. You can see just from the way it starts. Hey, you up in the sky learning to fly. Tell me how do you think you'd go before you start falling? Hey, you up in the tree. You want to be me? Well, that couldn't be because the people here... They don't hear you calling. And then verse two, he gets into it uh, pretty good. Hey, you wearing the crown, making no sound. I've heard you fell down. Well, that's just too bad. Welcome to my world. Hey, you stealing the light. I heard that the shine's gone out of your life. Well, that's just too bad. Welcome to my world. Really well done. The guitar work, uh, as always in all these, is awesome. Tony's, uh, Tony's drumming's fantastic. Liam sounds great. Very catchy song. I kind of like the tone of this uh, a little more. Then the second track, Shaker Maker, but both really good tracks. Now we're already up to the fifth track, Columbia, the second longest track on here. Noel said on the 2014 reissue of this, so years later to give him perspective, he said on this song, quote, when we started, we didn't have a lot of songs, so we just jam out current Acid House favorites and F about. Columbia derived from one of those nights. It was an instrumental we played it the first night I ever did a gig with Oasis. When we started at the Real People Studio, somebody had the idea of adding lyrics, and it's still a bone of contention to this day. Who actually wrote the words? We were all on acid at the time, but I know I wrote 90% of them. It's named in honor of the hotel in London because it was a roadie with Mark Coyle working for the Inspiral Carpets. We love that hotel. It was a scene of many nights of nonsense, and it sounded like a good title. I mean, why call anything anything? I mean, I couldn't say it any better myself. I'll stop it a little short because it's going to be a long, long, just slow fade out. A good song. I, I mentioned it during the, the reaction. The, the chorus is a little more catchy, kind of dialed back. The outro after that long instrumental break in there was mixed farther back. I mean, you could hear, hear them, but not real well. You know, a nonsensical song to some extent, because if you write a song on acid, that's what it's going to be. But I liked it for what it was. I think it was a bit too long. It didn't need to be quite that long. You could have dialed it back a minute, minute and a half. It would have been a little bit better, but still a good song. Now we're up to Supersonic. Debut single, 31 in the UK, 11 on the US Modern Rock Tracks chart. 
written and recorded in a single day at the Pink Museum Recording Studio in Liverpool. The band were there to record Bring It On Down, but first as a warm-up, they started jamming together. Soon, Noel was humming a melody over McCarroll and Bonehead's rhythm until he called the jam to a halt as it was time to start recording Bring It On Down. The intended song was not going so well, so it was decided that they work on something new based on a jam they had had earlier that day. The recordings were completed in 11 hours, and it was never remixed. Noel has claimed that the actual writing of the song took place while his bandmates took a break from the recording studio to order and eat Chinese takeaway. Instead of joining them, Noel stayed in the studio to develop his riff and had written the entire song before they returned. That's a great story. Super Sonic. Really like that one. I thought it sounded different instrumentally. You got the guitar solo at the end. You got the trademark sound. But I thought Tony's drumming in particular were fantastic. I thought it had, I don't know if I'd say a little less harsh sound to it, maybe. And maybe that's because it was never remixed. It was cut in a single day, but really liked it. He starts out, I need to be myself. I can't be no one else. I'm feeling supersonic. Give me gin and tonic. You can have it all, but how much do you want it? Uh, you make me laugh. Give me your autograph. Can I ride with you in your BMW? You can sail with me in my yellow submarine. Um, yeah, just really enjoyed that one. And I'm surprised it wasn't a bigger hit, but it was the first single, and it took a little while to grow. I bet if this would have been released as the fourth single, it would have had a lot more chart success. Bring it on down. Much harder edge, as I talked about at the start. Much more of a, of a ramped up pace from the very start. Great drumming from Tony. I mean, everything's great. The guitar works great. Um, but yeah, definitely a little bit of a different sound on that one for me. And as far as what it's about, Noel said, we smashed it when we used to play it live. I love the guitar solo and the drop down in the middle. Alan McGee obsessed over the line about being the underclass and wanted that to be the first single. For my part, all those songs that have a political undercurrent are real because I'm just writing them from the heart. I don't sit down and think politics. Let's get to the bones of this S. But at that point, I was unemployed and rented accommodation, trying to make it in the world, living from one week to the next, not knowing if you're going to have enough money for a pizza. You are in a political situation, even if you don't realize it. Because that's the battleground. That is the essence of politics. Accommodation, food, and trying to make a living. Pretty wise words there from Noel. You know, of course, you're the outcast, you're the underclass, but you don't care because you're living fast. You're the uninvited guest who stays till the end. I know you've got a problem that the devil sends. You think that they're talking about you, but you don't know who. I'll be scraping their lives from the sole of my shoe tonight. So that edge to it that he was feeling at the time, kind of being down on his luck. And I really do like that edgy songwriting. Now we're going to go to Cigarettes and Alcohol, fourth and final single, number seven in the UK. Spent 79 weeks on the charts there. The song proclaims the inherent appeal of cigarettes, alcohol, and other drugs as a remedy to the banality and seemingly futile nature of working class life. Lines such as, is it worth the aggravation to find yourself a job when there's nothing worth working for? Taps into a common sentiment of disenchantment in the 90s. Alan McGee, who discovered the band, boisterously claimed upon first hearing the song that it was one of the greatest social statements of the past 25 years. It was the second case in which his Oasis was accused of plagiarism. The first, of course, being Shaker Maker, which I talked about. The main riff of this song is lifted from Get It On by T-Rex, who themselves took it from Little Queenie by Chuck Berry. It also bears a similarity to the opening of Humble Pie's cover of the Eddie Cochran song, Come On Everybody. I don't know this song. I know Trey does because I know he did a, a B-Sides and some different other Oasis stuff that I didn't do. Cigarettes and alcohol. Remember, this is one of the three songs that, that Noel said I pretty much summed up everything I wanted to say and rock and roll star live forever in cigarettes and alcohol. After that, I'm repeating myself, but in a different way. Very short lyrically. It's, it's like a lot of these songs. It's all about atmosphere, guitar, drumming. On the meaning of the song, Noel said, let's have it was the main ethos. All the songs were about leaving Manchester and ending up in the sunshine, taking drugs and drinking for the rest of your life. Rock and roll star, live forever, cigarettes and alcohol. It's all about escapism. A pint in one hand, your best mate in the other, and just having a good time. So, you know, there, there's just not much. The course, you could wait for a lifetime to spend your days in the sunshine. You might as well do the white line. I guess he's talking about cocaine, right? Because when it comes on top, you got to make it happen, make it happen. And then it's got the line about working. Um, it's a crazy situation, but all I need are cigarettes and alcohol. I can see how this is kind of a anti-establishment song that could stay on the charts for 79 weeks, which is an insanely long time. Let's head over to the ninth track, Digsy's Dinner, a very short track. 
The story behind it after Noel's musician friend Peter Digsy Dreary started singing nonsensical things about having lasagna for tea, he promptly inspired a romantic vignette about asking a girl out, which Digsy wound up hating, retaliating with another called Noel's Nose. Noel on the song, if you wrote Digsy's Diner now, the Guardian or the music papers would destroy you. It's a song about going to someone's house for lasagna. You can only write songs like that when you're free of inhibitions. And Alan McGee said on it, I think it was a piss take of Blur. I don't think Noel's ever going to admit to that. It's a piss take of that Brit pop thing. It was Noel proving that he could do that in his sleep. Okay, pretty much nonsensical lyrics. I mean, he's invited the girl over. They're going to have tea. He's going to treat her great. And they're going to have lasagna. And then all her friends are going to be envious of her. So, But it actually sounded great, right? It had that sound. It almost had more of a What's a Story Morning Glory sound to it. So I actually really enjoyed that song. Now, as you see, we're up to slide away. Noel claims he wrote it on a Les Paul guitar that Johnny Marr sent to him since he had few guitars available to him at the time. He wrote it about his girlfriend at the time, Louise Jones, and the song was written about their stormy relationship. He described them as soulmates, and when they finally split up in June of 94, Noel said, I don't think I'll ever get over it. During the recording of this album, there was an argument between Noel and rhythm guitarist Bonehead. Gallagher was taken to the pub by bassist Paul McGuinn, where he calmed down, had a few drinks, went back to the studios and recorded Slide Away. Noel said it was considered as a fifth single, but he ultimately refused, arguing you can't have five singles off a debut album. He comments that the track contains his brother William's best ever singing. It is claimed to be Paul McCartney's favorite song by Oasis. In 2019, AME ranked it as the number one Oasis song. Wow, that's high praise. Slide Away. I'll tell you what, I've heard this before. I did an Oasis Top 10 a long time ago for one of our patrons, so I think a couple of these popped up on here. I know this one did. This one might have been number one. you got to go watch it after this is over. Um, just a fantastic song. I mean, Liam does sound great. Noel says, uh, Slide Away is the unsung hero on that album, round about the time that was everybody's effing tune, everybody's bird. Again, it's about an imaginary individual. It's teenage love affair stuff that I wrote off the cuff in the studio. You know, we never get to sing it live because Liam won't sing it. They were still together at this time. He was 19 when you first heard him sing it. There's that line, let me be the one that shines with you. Well, Liam reckons he spontaneously came up with that, but I've got a demo where I clearly can be heard singing it. It's just an effing tune, man. And, you know, it's, the, it's all about the way Liam delivers that chorus. You know, that now that you're mine, we'll find a way of chasing the sun. Let me be the one that shines with you. In the morning, we don't know what to do. Two of a kind, we'll find a way to do what we've done. Let me be the one who shines with you and we can slide away, slide away, slide away, away. Just the way he delivers it has such a fantastic tone. They're firing all cylinders with the instrumentation. It doesn't take over the song. They let Liam's vocals shine a little more than in a lot of these, but uh, really enjoy that one. Now we're up to the last song, Married with Children, but we might have ourselves a bonus track after this, so stick around when this one's over. Married with Children. Partly inspired by the American sitcom, partly inspired by when Noel was living with Louise Jones. An interesting way to end this album, although we're going to have a bonus track here coming up in a minute. But just acoustic, right? Just Noel playing the guitar and Liam singing. So a different sound to it for sure. And I think what it's about is pretty obvious. Uh, Noel says, it's another song that anybody could relate to because if you live with a girlfriend or just a flatmate, there are always petty things that you hate about them. And this song's just about pettiness. It is, that is exactly what it's about. Um, he starts out with a chorus in the song, so that's always a, a nice songwriting technique. There's no need for you to say you're sorry, goodbye, I'm going home. Then the verse is, I hate the way that even though you know you're wrong, you say you're right. I hate the books you read and all your friends. Your music's blank. It keeps me up all night, up all night. And then the second verse, I hate the way that you are so sarcastic and you're not very bright. You think that everything you've done is fantastic. Your music's ass. It keeps me up all night, up all night. Apparently, Louise might have told Noel that a time or two. And then, But the bridge, it'll be nice to be alone for a week or two, but then I'll be right back, right back here with you, with you. So he knows even though he can't stand the stuff she's doing, that he's going to end up being back with her again. So I like that one just because it was so much different. Now, as you can see below, we're going to have a bonus track. Sad song because Richard, the patron that brought this set, I recommend putting this in the reaction as it did appear on the vinyl. It also appeared on the Japanese edition. On this, Noel performs the vocals as opposed to Liam. However, the 2016 documentary Oasis Supersonic features an early core recording with Liam performing the vocals, and Liam would later actually play this song during his 2019 MTV UK Unplugged performance. Noel on the song, he said it's an early song, a hidden gem. Remember Clint Boone from the Inspiral Carpets? 
going, you're not going to call it sad song, are you? S title. That's what it says in the song, though. I don't give an F about titles. I've got one called Cigarettes and Alcohol. Nothing's worse than that. Sad song, the bonus track on the vinyl and Japanese editions. I'm very glad Richard had me include that. Fantastic song. Great acoustic playing from Noel here and also him on the vocals. And really, the song is just about, I think, kind of the state of society at the time they were writing this, let alone now. Sing a sad song in a lonely place. Try to put a word in for me. It's been so long since I found this space. You better put in two or three. We as people are just walking around. Our heads are firmly fixed in the ground. This is before cell phones just took over the world. What we don't see, what well, can't be real. What we don't touch, we cannot feel. Um, we're just throwing it all away. We're throwing it all away. Nobody says it's wrong, so we don't ask why, because it's just all the same at the end of the day. And then he hits that that chorus. It, a really well-written song. Should have made it on to the, to the proper album, but I realized there was only so much space. Well, that is going to bring me to my favorite tracks. Honorable mentions. I have Cigarettes and Alcohol. Then I have a couple of ones that may not be on other people's list. Dixie's Dinner and Mary with Children. And also this last song, Sad Song. I'm going to go ahead and include it on here just because I know it's a, a bonus track technically, but man, it is so good. My faves, I know they're going to be stereotypical, but they're great songs for a reason. Rock and Roll Star, Live Forever, and my favorite by far, Slide Away. What a, uh, what a great album, man. We'll get to my overall album score. Here's the deal. I know way more about the second album, What's a Story, Morning Glory. I've heard it a bunch. So it's hard to really compare it on a first listen to this, but this is a really, really good album. Very consistent. Not a bad song on here. Uh, I rate it incredibly high in the Britpop that I've heard, and I love the Britpop sound. So this is going to be an 8.0 on first listen for me, but I'm definitely going to revisit it. Thank you, Richard, for bringing this one. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. If you'd like to support us in any way, the way Richard does, check out the Patreon link below or the one on the end screen that's about to hit. I'll put our other review of Oasis in that end screen. Click on that link. Give it a watch. Until next time, guys, I will see you.